So thanks for coming along. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic turnout. And hopefully what I've got to talk about really works well with what Andrew had to talk about as well. So most of us probably grew up watching cartoons as kids. Like, it's kind of almost a universal constant. Uh, you know, we probably grew up watching even some Japanese cartoons. Uh, and that's because humans love things moving. And the history of animation is, is old, obviously. You know, we have had commercial animation since the early 20th century. Uh, with sort of the, the precursors to that in the 19th century. But there's some suggestion that Greek ephora, the, the kind of jars they had, you've probably seen them with kind of pictures around them, were actually a kind of animation. They, they, they represented different states. But even that, like two, two and a half thousand years ago, it is not where it really begins. There's some suggestion now that the earliest cave paintings were a kind of animation, because as you move the light around within the cave, they appear to move, right? So, so there's something very ancient about us. We love seeing things move. And the web, though, for the longest time, really has been a very static kind of experience. When it first began, it didn't, nothing moved, nothing changed. We even had this concept of being lost in hyperspace because like, the transitions were so sudden between different spaces. Right? But then we got the blink element. And that's actually the blink element being emulated with uh, CSS there. Uh, and then, and I don't know if you remember, like, it was literally everywhere, which again is like, completely useless, but a testament to the fact that it, we just wanted something to move. Like, it was like the pulse to show us it was alive. And then, of course, you know, we got bored with it, and then the marquee came along, and everything was a marquee. And you probably, you're, many of us, certainly my experience, kind of mid to late 90s, our first experience of JavaScript, it was really only good for basically doing rollover effects, right? Mouse over effects, mouse, mouse goes on, mouse goes off, and the things would change, right? So that's the kind of beginning of animations when it comes to the web. And of course, I'm, I'm going to go do a bit of a disservice to Flash and the related technologies, because of course, a lot of these technologies came with Flash and other competing plugin-based technology. But I'm talking kind of about the standards-based web, just to keep it simple. But all those were kind of simply visual effects. And then the web, because the web was essentially stateless, both in terms of client and server, but because basically we had very little way of changing the state of a page we worked in. And then the DOM came along, and JavaScript came along, and CSS and the DOM gave us the ability to sort of change what something looked like on the page based on its state. Right? So originally we had things like hover and focus. And really, I think one of the reasons that CSX be CSS became successful so early was because you could do the hover effect. Right? So all that stuff with the hours of JavaScript cutting and pasting and the thing and the downloads and the images, and you could just do with the hover effect. Right? And so I really do credit a lot of the success of CSS to the hover selector. It's, I reckon it's one of the very early things most people use. And now we do all these really cool stuff we can have enabled and disabled. So all the, the browser's constantly changing the state of things within our pages, and we can now then style those declaratively. Right? We don't have to write some JavaScript to say, if this thing conforms to this pattern, then do this thing with it. Right? Just say, if it's enabled, then style it this way. Or if it's valid, import style it that way. All right. But the problem with these sort of state changes from a user experience perspective is they're very harsh, and they're very kind of abrupt. If you blink, you miss them, because right? it's just on and off. So it doesn't, it's not very soothing. Right? It's kind of shouting at us. And, 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 and you know, there's a whole heap of challenges around that. So there we add a little box shadow to an input when it's on focus. Right? And that's the sort of thing we've been doing for a long time. But then, kind of particularly with the rise of JavaScript frameworks, one of the things that came with them a lot of the time was, was these animation kind of toolkits. So that we could, we could animate the changes in state with JavaScript. So we basically would change the box shadow property. We would set a timeout. We would loop around, set interval, loop around. But that's incredibly computationally intensive, which particularly in the world of mobile devices means battery life is really hammered. And it's lots of work for developers, right? Despite the fact that some tools that will remain nameless still do this to this day rather than using what we're going to talk about today. And that's where this thing called CSS transitions comes in. Right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how very quickly and easily and in a very good performant way we can make our interfaces much more fluid, much more animated. All right, so here, what we do with a CSS transition is we say to the browser, any time this particular property changes, I want you to animate that change over this period of time. So the first part we say by using the property transition property. And we say, OK, in this case, we're saying when the box shadow changes, we want that change to be animated over one second. Right? So there's, there's the code on the screen for you to do that. And this is what happens right? with the equivalent of before. Right? So instead of that really jarring kind of effect, we get this nice, smooth effect. And of course, from a backwards compatibility point of view, if it's not supported, the user doesn't miss out on much. Right? 
I would not go to the trouble of using a JavaScript library to animate that for IE whatever that doesn't support this, right? So please don't do that, right? Please. I know it's hard to convince your boss. Some, some, okay. So um, those transitions uh, that we've been looking at, basically, they, they're occurring through our, basically CSS, right? So we're saying here, um, input colon focus, give it a box shadow. And then with this, with this particular rule here, we're saying, OK, so when that box shadow property changes, then transition that. But of course, we can change properties with more than just CSS. We can use JavaScript and the DOM, right? So we, we can uh, basically say, with the DOM, with this element, change its style property of, of something to something else. And also, users change their window size. They, they zoom their font size. They change things like settings. And if those things change while your page is loaded, they will be animated as well. Right? So this applies to any change of your named property. So let's have a look at a really common uh, kind of pattern here, where we might have a, a group of properties uh, that are grouped together. And we, wanna, we may want to kind of hide them and show them. Like this, are sometimes referred to as an accordion. Right? So here's what we might do. We might have a height of auto in its expanded state and a height of zero in its collapsed state. And then we're going to use class list, which uh, Andrew referred to briefly, which is one of my favorite things in the DOM, because class list and query selected together may, it means you don't need jQuery anymore. right? And this is a very good thing. Right? So with class list, what we're going to basically do is we're going to toggle that. Right? So we're going to give it a collapsed class value uh, and, an, and then remove that. So when we give it a collapsed class value by clicking, it collapses, right? which is nice. It gets things out of the way, but it's, it's jarring. And, and it's confusing, and, and, and you know, like for all sorts of people that may have um, you know, real uh, people with cognitive difficulties, for example, might have some real usability or accessibility challenges to it. So what would be really nice is if we could animate that, right? And of course, you've, we've seen that done a million times with JavaScript, right? But we don't want to use JavaScript. So you naively we would think, okay, well, we're animating the height, right? So why don't we uh, basically have transition height one second? So there's a there's the uh, the shorthand version of our transition property that we saw before. So transition height one second. So what I'm saying is when the height changes, Mr. Browser, Mrs. Browser, Ms. Browser, whoever, whatever gender or whatever you, your browser happens to be, usually depends on how well it's behaving. Or maybe we think of IE as a man and Chrome as a woman. I don't know, right? <laughs> what about in French? Is a browser f female or male? Who speaks French? Is it, is it female? No, it's male. Of course it's male. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. All right, I could go down a rabbit hole there. I probably should avoid. So, <laughs> so it'd be really nice. So we thought, okay, we want to animate height. So let's do this, right? Let's go animate this height thing, and we're going to click it, and that animation didn't seem to happen. So what's going on here? Has John just made a mistake? Well, that's what you're probably going to think. Uh, but here's the first important lesson: not every property can be animated. Now, that makes sense. For example, what would it mean to animate between underline and not underline, right? Some of these things, they just, the, 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 what does it mean to animate that state, right? But some things you might think can be animated can't be animated, right? So if you have display none and display block, and you cannot animate between them, right? despite the fact you might think, well, surely that's animatable, right? So that's the first thing beyond the syntax, which is pretty straightforward to do. You really have to start learning what's animatable and what isn't. But it's not only some properties that are animatable and some aren't. There's also the challenge that some kinds of value are animatable and some aren't. So one of the rules is you can't animate between an auto value and a length value, or an auto value and a percentage value. You can automate between a percentage and a, a, a length. Like You can go from 20 pixels to 20%, but you cannot do it from length to auto. So I can't say 0 to auto. You cannot animate that. Right, so what are we going to do here? Well, naively, again, you might think, OK, well, why don't we set uh, animate height? But instead of setting auto, we'll make it like 100 pixels or 5M. But you can start seeing already what the problem is. Well, really, auto is the right one. I want the browser to worry about how, this, you know, how it's laid out. I don't want to have to worry about that, right? So here's the little trick. This is, the reason why I'm really going to some detail about this is because this is one, this animating things like dimensions is one of the co most common animations that we see. Uh, and this, is, this will bite everybody the first time they try it. So I'm sort of hoping, if for no other reason uh, that you came along today, you get the benefit of not having to get spending half a day working this one out, right? So instead of animating the height, we're still at auto and zero, right? So that's still happening. But we're going to animate the max height. 
right? Because if we set a max height greater than the auto value, that's where the height stops, right? So let's see what happens when we use max height instead of the, of the value, right? So here we have um, a still got a height of auto. Uh, we've got a max height of 10m. So basically, I've chosen a value that I know will always be larger than the height when it's expanded, right? And then in the collapse state, I've set a max height to zero. And what happens? Well, let's see. And we get it nice, smooth little zoom there. There's some complexities around using this that I won't go into today, but that there's basically a technique that will come in very handy as soon as, as, soon as you um, start playing around with animating your layout of your pages. So we've taken some really common design patterns that probably every one of us have implemented one way or another, and we've animated them in a way that doesn't have any JavaScript, right? which means a whole heap less development cost, a whole heap of less, a heap of things that we don't have to do and worry about. So that's Pretty nice value we've got there already. But as I mentioned very briefly, it's not, just, it's not just when we change with CSS. It's however the properties change in the browser, whether it's via the DOM and scripting, whether it's via the user zooming their text size and so on. So you can get some interesting effects happening when the user zooms uh, their properties. And that's not something you can't only apply transitions in the case of the DOM or, or, or CSS, it basically applies all the time. So it's just something worth knowing about with CSS transitions. Right? Now, hopefully, too, what you've noticed is th this is happening in a browser, just as Andrew's slides were, um, all running in, in, in a modern browser. And in fact, I think the number of uh, slide systems built in the world is kind of closely approaching the number of J JavaScript developers. Uh, I think everyone builds their own one. Uh, so what I've done here is just give you a sense of what other sorts of things we can do with transitions. So we can delay a transition. Right? So it doesn't have to start the moment a class value is applied or something is selected. We can delay it. So in this case, if you have a look at my slides, just to give you a sense here, as they come in, that's a weird effect for reasons I won't go into, they kind of slide in not exactly at the same time. The same transition animation is applied to every single list item. It's just I delay them based on using the nth child selector. So this, there's a delay of 0.3 seconds on the second list item, a delay of 0.5 seconds on the third, and so on and so forth. Right? So there's this, the same trans animations applying. So the principle there in animation, and we've got Pascal de Silva, who is a fantastic animator speaking after lunch, and he's going to talk about principles of animation. This is called secondary effect. Right? So where in animations, you have a primary effect, which is a whole slide coming in, but all these secondary effects come in as well. So what I'm really interested in, although I'm not talking about it so much today, is how we don't just randomly kind of include all sorts of popping, whizzing, crazy stuff, but we start really learning what animators have learned over the last 50 or 60 years. Right? So there's some fantastic work on that. And I really recommend if you're interested in implementing this stuff, you go and, and see what Pascal's talking about, where he really talks about a lot of these principles. All right? so, one, this is the secondary animation. And what I'm doing is I'm just delaying the animation on subsequent elements. So who knows what the secret of, of comedy is? Anyone know the secret of comedy? Well done. Right? So it's so funny. Isn't it? <laughs> so, but the, the truth is the secret of animation is also timing. Right? Once, that's the thing you really have to understand about making animation work. So here's, here are my slides in a really bland version, right? Watch this again. It's so exciting. Would you want to, would you even, no, please don't watch it again. Right. So firstly, we've got no secondary effect. But why is that bland compared to all the other sort of things you've been seeing, which hopefully you think, oh, that's kind of cool. I don't know. I think it's cool. So let's think about the problem of animation. We're, we're telling the browser, OK, you know this property, left? When it changes, I want you to go and animate that change over a second. But the question is, how does the browser decide the timing of that animation? Should it be should, halfway through the animation? Should it be halfway through, a third through, a third through? Like, is this sort of, and that's a linear calculation, right? And that's really easy for browsers to do, right? But what you've just seen is linear timing. And linear timing is, on the whole, really boring, right? So boring, in fact, that it is not the default behavior of the browser. So what we can do, though, is we can tell the browser what cushioning, which is the term in animation, 
or easing, which is often used as well. What easing or cushioning do we want? Using a property called timing function. Right? So we have transition timing function, and we can give it a number of keyword values. We can give it the value of ease, ease in, ease out, ease in out, and linear. Right? And most of the time, really, you only have to use ease. Right? Because it's, it, it, it kind of feels nice, where basically kind of something speeds up a little and then slows down again. Right? But just a picture's worth a thousand words. So I don't, here is the same kind of set of items using each of the different uh, keyword values there. Right? So the first linear, the second's ease, ease in, ease out. So the basic idea is some can slow up, uh, speed up and slow down again. Some start slow and end up fast. Some things start fast and end up slow. And those cover a lot of the circumstances that we're going to, you know, they work fine for a lot of transitions, like between color states and fading from, from opacity to, you know, zero to one and things like that. But as soon as you start particularly moving things around in space, those basic keywords kind of don't give us a ton of great optionality, right? So then I'm not going to go into it today, but in fact, we can define our own timing functions using cubic Bezier curves, right? So you basically have a cubic Bezier curve that that describes the progress versus time. Uh, and if your eyes are glazing over at this point, there are some really great tools. So if you just do so kuzikbezier.com, Leah Veru, who spoke here last year, fantastic kind of developer, designer, she's got a tool where you basically drag a couple of things around and you create your timing curve and then you paste the value in and all of a sudden you can kind of change all your cushioning. Right? But the, I guess the point to take away from that is that, that timing you will find is really where you work your hardest making animation feel kind of um, credible, believable, right? Because that's what we're trying to do. You know, okay, so here's my little thing about skeuomorphism, right? Just a little aside, right? So everyone said, oh, the death of skeuomorphism, right? You know what? We've seen the death of faux stitching and all that. That's great. But skeuomorphism is essential to what we do when we design user experiences for people, right? Because we're emulating stuff from the real world all the time. We're taking cues because humans know how the real world works, right? So, and buttons, and things, you know, like, we, we, we'll never get away from skeuomorphism, and that's fine. It's just that we shouldn't associate skeuomorphism with stitching and felt. And so, to me, like, that whole debate has been completely sidetracked by a very narrow understanding of what the word means, right? So, to me, animation is about skeuomorphism. It's about using cues from the real world in our interfaces, right? And we're designing with time. But the thing about animation is animators don't do physics, right? They, because if you do, it's the uncanny value, value effect, right? You do something that looks and feels right, and the physics be damned. It can be a nice guide to what you do, right? But it shouldn't be, we're not driven by physics. So that's where animation design, as I said, it's all about timing. And what we're trying to do is make people feel something with that animation. So don't get too hooked up in the mathematics of it. Just a couple of things before we wrap up on transitions, and we're looking at a couple of other ways of animating, and particularly how we animate things around the page uh, using uh, transforms. Uh, browser support. Well, basically, it's, it's, this stuff is, transitions in particular, pretty well supported across all modern browsers and devices. Uh, in uh, pre uh, Safari, Safari 6 desktop and before iOS uh, Safari 6, um, but not 7, and all Android devices, you basically need the WebKit prefix. Right? So you're still going to add that in for the time being. You no longer really need MOZ or MS anymore. Uh, and the good thing about transitions, for the most part, is if, if a device doesn't support it, it really isn't, a, on the whole, a big deal. Right? Unless, you, it, unless you are requiring that transition to actually convey meaning or provide functionality, then the absence of it is not a drama. Right? So I would definitely not invest a ton of energy trying to emulate this stuff with JavaScript for older devices, partly because you're already taking an older, less performant device, and you're doing a much less performant thing on it, right? So do your very best to not try and fall back to older. You know, really think about that progressive enhancement. I think that applies so strongly in this particular area, right? I know it's very hard to convince your boss about that. <laughs> I know that's, but tell them, send it to me, right? I'll convince them for you. You get that for free. That's my job. Maybe my job in life is you go around convincing people's bosses and clients. Actually, some people actually ask me to go and do that. And I'm happy to oblige for a reasonable fee. <laughs> so transitions have a number of limitations. Right? What they're designed for is basically your observation that states the physical appearance of things in pages change based on mostly user interactions. Right? So we know that's happening. And we change the appearance of those things, so why not animate them, right? So transitions are a very simple declarative way 
of saying, you know what, when this changes, I want you to animate that, and I want this timing function, I want it to take this long, right? But that's not the only kind of animation. And it's also very, there's two what we call keyframes, right? There's a beginning and end, right? And they start and they continue until they finish and they stop, right? And they're only triggered by a change in the property, right? So they're, they're sort of, when the property changes, the animation applies, right? But there's another thing that we may well need with animation, which is, uh, sort of goes the other way around, right? So firstly, things that happen over multiple steps, right? They don't just go from A to B, but they go to A to B to C to D and so on. And they may, like a transition only happens once, right? Beginning, end, stop. We can't say, can you do this transition 50 times? No, nope. right? Uh, we may want things to do that. Um, and then the other thing is that they apply directly to put on a per selector basis, right? So we use a selector to select elements and then we give them a transition property, set of properties, right? So if we want to have the same type of effect on lots of different elements, then we have to apply different transitions to each of them, even if they're pretty much doing the same thing, right? So reuse is really bad there, right? So for all those reasons, we have a, a more, I guess, sophisticated version of transitions called animations. Now, what's really cool is the principles are all the same, and the properties are almost identical. But instead of saying transition name, oh, so transition property, or transition duration, or transition delay, we'd say animation delay, or animation timing function, right? So but here's, so, but it's slightly more involved to you. So with transitions, we just get a selector, we say transition this please, and we're away. With animations, first we have to define the animation, and then we apply the animation to elements using CSS selectors. So we define the animation using a at keyframes rule. Uh, I'm going to show you what we might do with that, and then we'll go and build this animation for you. And then we're going to play around with some other animations as well, right? So instead of, of our simple transition on input element, let's make it pulse while it has focus, right? So we focused on it. That seems to be, you know. So basically, it's sitting there and pul uh, pulsing, right? So using the box shadow, it's pulsing away. So we're drawing attention to it. So we, basically, we're creating an animation that does that. And when it's on focus, we're saying, apply this animation until I no longer have the focus, and it will stop pulsing, right? So how do we do this? So the first part, as I said, is we create an at keyframes rule. So we all know about at font face rules, right? If you want to use a font beyond what's built into your, into your system, you use an at font face rule, which defines the name of the font face and all the different fonts that the browser should use, depending on you know, what browser it is or what they support, what format they support, or whether online or offline, a heap of stuff like that, right? So in the same way we have at font face or at media, we have at keyframes. And a keyframes uh, rule has a name. I'll, I'll show you an example in just a second. Uh, and then it defines keyframes. So in animation, a keyframe is sort of the, the major stages in an animation that then in between either computers or in the olden days, junior animators <laughs> would fill in in between, right? It's called tweening, if it's a term that probably some of you know very well and others have probably heard, right? So here what we basically do is we define the keyframes and the browser tweens between those keyframes, right? And it looks um, a little bit unusual by comparison with what you've seen before, uh, but it, it follows the conventions of CSS very well, right? So they look like this. At keyframes pulse, so pulse is the name of our at keyframes rule. The whole thing goes in curly braces. And then within the curly braces, we have, in this case, only two uh, keyframes at 0%. So instead of having a selector, like P or whatever, we have a percentage value. And by the way, the percentage, you can't just have zero. You've got to have the percentage there, right? Uh, and then we have a set of properties within that statement, that rule, that says, in this case, only one. I want the box shadow at zero to um, basically have no blur and not be displaced, so essentially you can't see it. But we could add other properties there as well. We could, as we'll see in a second, we could say we want it to, to be wider or more narrow, for example. We can change, so basically any animatable property can be included there as a bundle of properties. And then in the final step, at 100%, we're saying, well, we want our box shadow to be yellow, have a 12 pixel blur, and so on and so forth, right? I've actually changed the example to be more visible. It's now insets, it's slightly wider and different color because it just on these screens it didn't work so well, but that's the basic principle. So there we've got only two keyframes. So in a way, it's not much different to a transition, but we get all these other benefits that we're going to see by using um, animations or keyframes instead of transitions.
So we create the keyframes, but we've got to still attach it to an object. So how we go about doing that is we use a selector to select the objects that we want to have this animation, right? It could be every paragraph. It could be every input element. It could be even the most exotic selector we want, right? And then we say, in this case, when, we have a when the input is in the focus state, I want you to use the animation named pulse, and I want you to fire that for a 0.7 of a second duration, right? I want that animation to occur for over 0.7 of a second. So basically, at zero, it will be no box shadow. And at 0.7 of a second, which is 100%, it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to be the box shadow appearing. Right, let's see what happens when we do this. And click. And it came and it went. Hmm. So what's going on there? Right, let's do it again. We haven't lost focus. Right, so by default, it only does it once. All right? And once it gets to the end, it reverts immediately to the properties that it had before the animation started, right? Because we're just saying apply this animation. We're not saying it's different to transition, where we're basically saying when this gets this property, do this animation. In this case, we're saying apply this animation to it, right? So it's done at once over 0.7 seconds, and it's gone away, right? So we have to do a few more things to get our pulse to work properly. So what are we going to do next? We've seen that. OK, so now what we, what we want to do, we want to tell it how often we want it to iterate, right? So these are, these, are some, these are some property names that only a developer could love, right? Only a spec writer could love this one, right? So animation iteration count, right? And of course, when you prefix it, it becomes web, web kit animation iteration count, right? And then we have a buffer overflow because our, you know, our names are too long, right? So as I said, by default, that is one. But we can give it any whole number value, or we can give it the keyword infinite. Right? So basically, we say animation iteration count infinite. It means do, keep doing this forever. So let's have a look and see what happens. Here's our one again. Right? So it's pulsing. But notice what's doing. It, you might initially think, well, wouldn't it kind of maybe do a nice pulsating? But here it's sort of, I'm not sure how visual. Oh, that, it's, it's sort of kind of jarringly jumping. from. The, like, so what it does is it does the animation 0.7 of a second, instantly jumps back to the initial value of the, of, that the property had before the animation was applied, and does it all over again. Right? So, you know, it's kind of cool, but it's probably not what we want just yet. I'm like, God, it's so, I can almost imagine an alarm going off, right? And we don't want it to be alarming. We just want it to be nicely kind of drawing our attention to it, right? So what can we do? So what we might want to do is to say, look, we don't just want you to begin in the beginning, the beginning go to the end, and then jump straight back to it. We want you to alternate, right? We want you to go nicely from beginning to end and back again, right? So by default, so we do this with a property called animation direction. Right? And by default, it just goes to the end and jumps back. But we can say alternate, right? and now we'll see what happens. Right? So what we're saying, actually, in this case, I want it to happen five times, and I want it to alternate. So let's see what happens. Think about what you think is going to happen. One, two, three. Hang on. Five. Can't you count? One, two, three. Right. So what's happening is it, it's going from 0 to 100% over 0.7 a second, and it's going from 100% to zero because it's alternate, but it's, it, it's not doing the whole round trip in 0.7 of a second. It's going 0.7, and then it comes back, and it goes over, and it comes back, and then it goes over, and it's finished, and it jumps back to the beginning. Right? So that's what you've got to keep in mind, is with alternate, it's also a step in the animation as part of the animation iteration count. And, and the alternate direction also takes the same amount of time. It's not like a round trip. It's kind of, it just bounces backwards and forwards between the two, right? So here's what we probably want to do. We want it. Imagine we did only want it a handful of times, like the five times. Because, you know, it get really annoying sitting there shouting at us, right? So we want it to pulse a little bit and stop. But when it stops, we don't want it to lose and go back to its initial values, right? We want to maybe to hold that focus value. So what we do is we, another name that just, like, uh, you have to just remember, right? It's called the animation fill mode, right? And the fill mode is when I get to the end, do I jump back to the beginning? Or do I go forwards? What that means is do I stay at the end, right? They could, they could work on the names here, but anyway, right? You just have to learn these things. So here we go. One, two, three, and then it holds, right? So it's gone forward and back, forward and back, forward and holding, right? So we see these are most of the properties we're going to need, right? We're going to, the number of times we want to iterate, 
how long each iteration takes, whether it goes forward and back or just goes forward and jumps back to the beginning, and whether at the end it stops and holds the values that it already had or it goes back to the values that it had before the animation began in the first place. All right, so with that, we've got most of the properties that we want to be able to do, to use. So what I want to try and do over the next, the other half of this presentation is to start using these properties to build some of the very common design <laughs> features that we already use, right? So I have this principle of non-sucky web development, right? And it is, if you can do it in HTML, don't use anything else. If you can do it with HTML and CSS, don't use JavaScript, and don't ever use jQuery, right? And that's harsh, but look, I really, I mean, it's interesting to hear what Andrew, someone asked Andrew um, before, you know, what major frameworks are you using? And, and really, uh, his answer could have been exactly what I talk about with people all the time, right? And including all the way down to class list polyfill, right? There's a couple of things like query selector and class list, which aren't supported in older versions of particularly Internet Explorer that basically obviate the need for pretty much every framework out there, right? Certainly in terms of those monolithic ones. So that strategy there, you know, um, you know, I'm a bit facetious there, but I think increasingly the browser is giving us so much of this power. But also a lot of it we can do declaratively, right? So we can do with HTML and CSS. And almost everything we're talking about today requires little, if any, uh, HTML. In fact, the only thing I'm really, sorry, JavaScript, the only thing I'm really doing with JavaScript is changing class values to sort of trigger state changes. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to build another of the world's great loved things, the carousel. All right. But you know, it's a very common pattern. People are going to, you know. So we're going to build a carousel. So it's very simple. We've just got a, a list of images, or in this case, not even a list, right? We're just going to have a ton of images inside a section, which is probably not the world's best markup, but I just want to make it as simple as possible. And here's the logic, right? So how can we do this without any JavaScript whatsoever, right? So we're going to have, in this case, five slides, right? So each slide will slide into view for a second, hold for four seconds, and slide out of view for a second. So if you add that up, you actually have a total animation time of 21 seconds, because the, the last one second is from the slide out of the fifth slide, right? So if you think about that, that so um, the values that we get there, I've done the calculation, but I'll show you the, so basically these were these odd looking values kind of look like. So, but what I'm going to do is create a single animation, and apply it to each image, but I'm going to use a delay, right? So the first animation is going to begin immediately. The second image will have the same animation applied, but it will be delayed by four seconds, right? So after four seconds, it starts coming in, the other one goes out. The third, eight seconds. The fourth, 12 seconds. And the fifth, 16 seconds, right? So what does this look like when we actually mark it up or we code it up? Right, so on the left, we have our keyframes uh, rule, right, which is uh, called carousel. And what I do is at zero seconds, uh, sorry, 0 percent, I, I want the thing purely off to the left, right? And no opacity, right? Not visible, it's transparent, right? Then at 4.76 seconds, which is a percent, which happens to be you know, the right value to be one second for a 21 second animation, right? We want it to, to basically go to zero on the left. So it's moved into view now and to become opaque, right? So in, over that first second, it will do that transition. Uh, and then at 19%, which is four seconds, or five seconds now, right? We want it to, st to basically still be there. So it's saying, at the, so with keyframes, Things don't actually have to change within keyframes. You look at the between the 4.76% and the 19%, nothing's changed, right? That's fine. We just, just stay there, please, right? And then at 23.8%, uh, which is actually another second later, we want it to be completely off, right? And then we don't want it to do anything for the rest of the time, right? So each of them is going to get this, but they're all going to do it with a delay, so one after the other. Uh, and then to show you on so then oh, the image, so on the on our right hand side. Uh, we're basically, how do we apply this? So we got the animation name carousel, which says, please, for images, use this animation name. All right? uh, I want the duration to be 21 seconds, so run this animation for 21 seconds. I want it to be linear. I've chosen linear because that's quite common in carousels, and also because that makes the gap. It, it actually works quite well, that particular thing. Uh, often linear doesn't work well, but this one's one. And I want it only to do it once. For all sorts of complex reasons, so I won't go into. Right. So, and then, but okay, that's for all images. But I'm saying, okay, I want no delay on our first image, nth of type. Uh, our, our second image, I want a four second delay. 
I love the nth of type selectors, right? Uh, third and fourth, so we give it a longer delay, right? So, so here's a really simple animation I want you to apply. Here's the properties I want to apply to those particular elements. And let's see what actually happens, right? So I'm going to play it, and we get this animation. I was fearful of that bit. It's not going to actually work. <laughs> but so here we have some nice uh, yeah, images from last year's uh, conference that I pulled in from Flickr the other day. And basically, this is a kind of classic carousel. There is not, well, the tiniest bit of um, JavaScript to basically trigger that animation. Right? But you wouldn't even need that. Because the question is, when does the animation start? Well, as soon as those selectors select the element, right? So you've got your keyframes. That image selector selects an element as soon as the page loads. Like all the images get selected. That animation starts right then, right? So you may not necessarily want that to be how it works. But uh, basically, an animation starts as soon as the conditions for the selector are met, right? And that's where you, know, you might use it on a hover state. You might want to start and stop an animation when you hover over something, for example. All right, let's see what else we can do without any JavaScript, because I love doing things without JavaScript. All right. Now, this is, I, I won't go into detail brief, much here, because Andrew's done a great job and touched on this a lot. But so, but, but just to reinforce what he talked about, what's going on under the hood? Well, this is an important thing to know about animation. If you were to sort of have a mutation observer, right, or if you were somehow listening to changes on the elements that you're animating, the DOM is constantly changing, right? If you inspect the DOM, during the animation, you will, the values that you're looking at will change over that time, right? Which, of course, means all sorts of potential problems with reflowing and repainting and so on. So we have to keep that in mind, that even though with animation we're not using JavaScript, so we're not on the main loop, right? And we're getting a lot of performance benefits by offloading that. So basically, we've not got this set interval where we're not you know, got reaching out or not using request animation frame even. We're basically just saying, browser, please look after this animation for me. And here's what I want to happen. And I think that browser developers are way smarter and better developer than me. Therefore, I, I trust that they're going to do a better job than I am. Uh, so that, that's why I like declarative stuff, because all right. But we still have these changes in the DOM, which can be very, very expensive. Right? So here's a little anime GIF, because what would a presentation be without anime GIF? I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is basically uh, that carousel. And if you see, it's basically drawing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of redraws and reflows and events every second. Right? I can't, I'm not sure if you can quite see the bottom. But so basically, the duration of that carousel, it does about 2,000, uh, 3,000. Maybe, yeah, about 3,000 events, right? Which, you know, isn't particularly performant. Uh, it has a heap of problems, particularly as we saw in mobile devices. And these things are quite attractive in mobile devices because users experience, you know, on the mobile device, people probably expect more, you know, animation and, and, and more of that sort of effect than they do on the desktop these days, right? So what can we do about this? Well, Andrew gave the game away. Uh, but what we do is we use a thing called transforms. And he's talked about why they, they are beneficial, which is great. So it means I don't have to go into all the details. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into more detail about what transforms are and what we can do about them. And probably most of us have had some exposure to them. Andrew referenced what they are. But basically, they allow us to take any element within a page uh, and basically move it along the x and y axis, right? Left and right, up and down. They allow us to rotate. And also, with 3D, which I'll get to in a few minutes, you know, basically zoom or, 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 or translate or move in and out from the element's face. Right? Um, effectively, most of the time you can think about of the screen, but we'll see why I've, I've used that expression. Right? So transforms, you know, they kind of have some value in, in, in page layout, particularly rotation. You know, it's a common design to have maybe a heading running alongside the text, that it's a you know, paragraph text for it. Right? So you can use them in that. But they really come into their own with animations, and particularly because of the performance benefits that Andrew's uh, touched upon earlier in this session. All right. So how do we use transforms? Right? So we have a new property called transform. So we, just like we apply a background color, we apply a transform. Right? And then the value of a transform is one or more functions. Now, CSS actually has functions. You don't need to use SAS to get functions in CSS. But there are specific functions. that are often associated with uh, generated content. For example, there's the Aspera function. Right? There's, the, there's calc, which is not entirely well supported yet. But, but here, here are a set of functions that are widely supported. Right? So we can translate left and right with translate x, 
we can translate up and down with translate y. We can rotate and we can scale, right? And there's a couple others, but these are the ones that are going to be most common, right? And in 3D, we can rotate in x and y, and we'll see what that means in a second. And we can translate in the z-axis, right? So what are all these, what's he talking about, all this axis and stuff? We'll talk about that in a second. Right, so let's have a look at some of the action. So this is translate x, right? So basically, how it works is we, with a selector, we select an element that we want to be transformed. We give it the transform property, and its value in this case is going to be translate, well, translate x, right? So what does that do? Well, I'm going to have a little interactive version, right? So you can see here, as we increase the value, it goes off to the right, and we decrease the value off to the left. Now, normally with relative positioning or absolute positioning, for example, uh, we position something with respect to a containing element, right? So if, if, a, if an absolutely positioned object is contained within the page and we, we give it a top of 0% or 10%, it's 10% of the height of the page, right? In this case, our values are with respect to the element itself, right? So 10%, or in this case, 147%, it means it's moved 140% 7% of the width of that element to the right or to the left. All right? So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And we can also use pixels if we wanted. Right? But it's with respect to the top left-hand corner of the element itself. So just to touch on how we could take our very poorly performant animation, just to go to show just by using animation, you don't necessarily get better performance, right? You've got to use it intelligently. Instead of in our initial version on the left, uh, or the right, hang on, this gets really confusing, right? The, the one that uses left values, oh, God, <laughs> right. it really is doing my head in this way. Um, so basically, I think it's the same, isn't it? Oh, I need a transform origin on this one, right? Uh, so basically, we initially use left, right? Left minus 100%, and then left to zero. In this case, we're actually going to use translate x, right? So initially, it's going to be translate x of zero, right? So we're going to, we're going to position the object off the page and then translate it onto the page uh, between 0% and 4.76%. Now, let's do this. All right, so this is what happens. We look at, so there is the identical... Uh, performance kind of output from our developer tools, and instead of like nearly 3,000 records, it's it's done at 40 now, right? So we're talking kind of two orders of magnitude fewer reflows, repaints, recalcs, that sort of stuff, right? It's uh, ultimately 73, so like a, a 50th as many right, impact. That's that, that's the that's how much less impact this has on the the browser and its performance and on the battery life of your mobile devices, right? Like, I don't know if it directly translates into one, you know, every action. It kind of, it's a linear scale between how much battery life you use or what. Right? But let's just say that's going to suck up a lot less battery power, right? So that's just one of the many reasons why we should be using these and using transform, right? One of my favorite is scale, right? So scale basically is a value between zero and a large number. Uh, and essentially kind of it zooms the, the, the size of the object in and out. Oh, up and down, left and right. right. So there we have scale of zero, scale of you know five. Right. So it's a so in this case it's a function that takes a numerical value. Right. So it doesn't have any it doesn't have units. It's not percentage. It's just one point one five, which means slightly bigger than one. Right. So anything between one and zero means smaller. Anything larger than than um, one, like two, is double. Three is triple in size and so on. And you can actually scale x and y independently if you really want. Uh, but in this case, mostly what you want to do is probably scale both to keep the sort of out. So here's a little fun thing that I've done with them. One of the things we do all the time is we just miss modal dialog boxes, right? <laughs> so what I've done is, is I've got a little um, animation to make uh, it go away in a slightly less boring way. And I use scale and opacity to do this. So let's dismiss our modal dialog box, right? We'll see that again. Right, so this actually uses an animation principle called the antic, right? It's, it, or a wind up. We're setting you up for the action that's going to occur, right? And you know what? You almost never use this. This is a really common, you watch any cartoon, they prep you. It's funny because you know it's going to happen, right? So in this case, what we're doing is we, you know what's going to happen. It draws you right to it, and then it vanishes, right? So 
Uh, to me, I've never seen anyone do anything, use animation principles like that. But, so we've used a little keyframe one, which says, at the beginning, and here I'm using a keyword from, because you can use from and to if you really want. At the beginning, I want it to be scaled normal size. At 60%, so like quite a while, I want you to slowly increase to 1.1. And then the last bit, I want you to zoom away really quickly. And that's what it does. It's really, I guess it's a cartoony effect. And I have exaggerated, but your cartoon's all about exaggeration. And in the right place, exaggeration is a really strong kind of visual thing that you can do. Right. Just the last thing I want to sort of show you, that I think it's really important as well, that at the moment, notice how it's been zooming in, it zoomed directly into the middle of the page, right? Because when we apply a transform, there's an origin to that transform. And the origin, by default, is right in the middle of the object, right? And we'll see what that, what that means, particularly in relation to rotation in a second. But this hey, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, transform it so it disappears into the middle of the page. So here's just the example. Transform origin is a property. Uh, and we can use keywords like top, left, bottom, right. Or we can use length values like 20 pixels. Or we can use percentage values like 50, 50, 150, right, whatever. If you played around the canvases at all, it should be very familiar. So here, I'm, I've changed the transform origin to top left, and I'm going to dismiss it, and it dismisses in the top left corner of the page, right? Which kind of might be a more interesting effect than just zooming straight into the page, right? It's a sense that all, all my tools are over here, so when I dismiss them, they go whoop over that way, right? And so I haven't had to, like, you might need, you know, if you wanted to do that without transform origin, you might need to, like, move it as well as scale at the same time, right? Applying two animations, where here I'm just saying, zoom it up to there rather than zoom it into there. So, a few more things to get through. So we talked about 2D, a left, down, up, and right. But the third dimension is this Z axis that comes out from the object, from the face of the object. Right? So we can translate x, y, and z. And we can rotate x, y, and z. So rotation is the, is the last thing we're going to look at. And then we're going to build a couple of quite complex things that I think look really Interesting. All right. So here we're going to rotate Z. Now, we're rotating around the Z axis. So I want you to stop for a second and think, what do you think is going to happen when I rotate this? Remember, this is 3D ants. This is the Z axis. We're going to rotate around the Z axis. What's going to happen? I'm not sure if you thought that was what was going to happen. But in fact, so the Z axis is coming out of the page or out of the element, and it's rotating around the axis. Right? So in 2D, you can just have a rotate property. But in 3D, you have rotate Z, and it's rotating around that axis. Right? Just so where do we get this 3D stuff from? Well, here's one, rotate x, right? OK, we're rotating x. You know, it's, I'm not sure it's kind of feeling all that 3D-like. What's going on? It's kind of 3D, but you know, it doesn't really convince me, right? Well, as with everything, we need perspective. <laughs> so perspective is almost like the distance the viewer is from the scene, right? So if you want to use animation terms, we have a scene, and within that scene, we have an object. And we want, how far is the person, the viewer, the camera from that, right? And that's perspective. Now, what's really interesting here is notice I'm applying it to the body. Right? You don't apply it to the object itself. You apply it to its containing element, or a containing element. And that becomes the scene. And that means any object within that body can have um, uh, transformation, 3D transformation applied to it, and the same perspective applies to all those objects, right? So it's not like it's, you're looking at a world, and these objects are within that world. So let's bring the user quite close, right? Let's bring the, the user quite close. So the lower the value, the closer they get. And let's rotate. And unfortunately, you do the zoom. This might be a bit better. We're going to rotate, and it's very foreshortened, right? It's very exaggerated. But as we zoom back, Right? It's almost like we're moving away from the world, and the foreshortening gets less. Right? So it's a kind of classic um, uh, one, point vanishing, one vanishing point, one point kind of perspective. I'm going to go use some of these things in a second. I just want to kind of you know, sort of show you what they're like. So rotating x, so what, is it, what it's doing is rotating around the x-axis. The x-axis is long here. It's rotating around a point at the moment through the middle of the x-axis. Right? And then rotation y, again, it's a little bit harder to see here, but we're rotating around the y-axis. But notice how the transforms combine, right? So if I rotate x and then y, they combine together to create a relatively complex transformation. And I'll see, we'll see some more of that in action in just a second. 
So you might be thinking, oh, yeah, it's cool and all, but isn't this a real gimmick? Isn't this just gimmicky? Well, I hate gimmicks. I hate gimmicks, right? But I don't think it is. And I think one of the reasons why we're kind of obsessed with this flatter design, we're getting away from the concept of like overt skeuomorphism. But what I think 3D, and, and another thing is our screens are, are kind of, our worlds are shrinking in terms of what we can see, but we're expecting more and more functionality to go into there, right? So what we, I think we can really do is we can use 3D space and we can use time to create, you know, to help people imagine a space in which your application lives and where the functionality is and how they relate to each other. And jarring transitions, like if something goes, is over here on the left and it just we, in no time comes here, that people have no sense of space of how that's related to this. Whereas when we animate that change, right, in two and three dimensions, we give people a sense of where things are in relation to each other, whether they're closer or further from them, whether they're on the left and right, up and down. Right? So to me, these are the tools that this gives us and why I don't think it's just a gimmick. And you know, this is why I actually think iOS 7 is really quite gimmicky, right? Because I don't think they're, and then having said that, I'm gonna show you something I think is quite cool in iOS 7, right? But I, I do think these things are quite gimmicky. So here's, Here's an effect, if you use uh, iOS 7 and Safari, you've probably seen, right? So basically, I'm going to step through, I'm going to show you how I'm going to build this, right? So that might be familiar to you. So all of this has been done essentially with um, no JavaScript. It's all been done purely with CSS transforms animation. So what we're doing is we're taking four iframes, right? So with four iframes, what we can do is we can lay them all in the same top left-hand corner, absolutely positioned, right? And then we give our body some perspective, right? So we're saying we're not too close to, this, to the world, right? So there they are, lay it up there, right? That's the first thing we're going to do, right? The only transform stuff we've done is giving them perspective, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to scale them, right? So they're going to scale into the page, right? So they're all now 50% of their size, scale 0.5. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, We're going to um, rotate them around the y axis. Oh, actually, that's wrong. Around the x axis, right? So rotate them around the x axis, right? So the axis there, rotate them around them, but each slightly differently. So they're sort of more, they're like fanned out. So if you're looking at side on, which we're going to show you in a second, the power of 3D, um, each one's rotated slightly more. And I've used that same trick of using a, a type selector, nth of type, to say this one should be this much, this one a bit more and more and more, right? And then we're going to like zoom them out of the page by translating in the z-axis, right? So each one's got like one zoom back a little bit, one's where it would normally be, one's more forward, and the next one's more forward again, right? Now notice what's really interesting here is they're not zooming out at you, right? They're zooming in the direction they've rotated, right? Because if you rotate and then translate, each of the functions is applied in turn, right? So I rotate and then translate, because if you translate it and then rotate it, they'd all come out of the page and tilt down, and that would not be what we want, right? And it's really worth exploring how these things work to get a sense, right? Because really, to me, this is a very, you've got to play around with this, right? So the last thing we need now here to play with all this, uh, just to tie it all together, is the perspective origin. So we, we know how we can move the camera or the viewer closer and further. We use the perspective property on a containing element on the scene, right? The bigger the number, the further away they appear to be, right? What we can also do is we can say where the viewer appears to be viewing the world from, right? So you can be you know, up toward the top, down toward the bottom, over here, over there, even right away from the world. Like, so the world's over there, I'm looking at it from over here, right? We use perspective origin, right? So income, we use perspective and perspective origin together to basically place a camera in three dimensions in relation to the world we've created over there, right? And it's pretty cool. So here, this is all live in the browser. This is exactly what I just built. And what we've got is the x origin, which means where it is in relation to the, to the, the world uh, left and right, where it is in the y origin, up and down, and where it is in relation to close and far away, right? So let's get close up and personal with our little effect here. Right? Let's just swing around a little left a bit. Oh, I've got to change the perspective to make it more obvious. All right, yeah, swing around. Whoa, look at this. It's all just being done by the browser, right? Right? We want to get about, you want to go down low, we go look up high. So it's like the lower the value, the higher up I am, right? Because remember, zero is up here, minus 100 is up there. So we're at minus 96%. We're right up high above the object, right? Now we're going down below the object, right? So this is all being done in the browser with the 3D stuff, right? And giving us a sense of how we can kind of explore these things. So, so if you remember the original, like if you had an iPhone, and, mo and most, of the, most of the kind of multi. Um, 
multitasking UIs do this, right? They have a series of cards in two dimensional space, right? Left, right? But you can only see two or three of them at a time, right? So you have to flick through them and keep going, and where was that one again, right? Suddenly, with this sort of thing, we're taking the third dimension allows us to bring so much more information onto the screen in a way humans are really good at, right? Humans are good at 3D. We live in a three-dimensional world. We've got two eyes. They're stereoscopic, right? <laughs> so this is why I really, uh, I'm clearly excited about this stuff. But I do. I think this is opening a door to all sorts of really, and people have been playing around with this interface for a long time. And Scott tomorrow will probably tell us all about all the crazy zooming stuff. For, do we remember, remember the zooming browser that Apple came out with in 1996? Yeah, yeah, we remember that. Remember, remember that? You actually zoomed through space, right? It was a gimmick. <laughs> So here's some of the things at our disposal. And you can tell I'm pretty excited, right? So what haven't I covered? So I haven't really covered in detail, but I did mention we can create our own timing functions for both transitions and animations, right? So they allow us to add a lot more nuance to animations. Right? And in fact, for each keyframe, you can have a different timing function, right? So if you want to create a bouncing effect, and if I, you want to play with this, do this. This is animation 101. Create a bouncing ball. It's harder than it looks, right? That is why, basically, that is the first thing you learn in animation school, and it's the first thing you should try, right? There's also these awesome events that happen during and after animations and transitions, right? So you can say, tell me when an animation is finished on this object, right? And you get an event, you have a listener on the window, and then you can do something, right? So I'm, you don't have to, like, oh, I know the animation takes a second, so I'm going to wait a second, then I'm going to do this thing, right? It's like, just tell me when it's finished, and I'll go do something else, right? So you can do that as well. Uh, there's this really weird relationship between positioning, z-index, layout, and transformation that I will not go into because I would take another hour on that. But for the most part, just know that basically once you transform something, it is as if it's positioned absolutely or relatively. It's get, it becomes a containing element for its descendant elements. Right? And then there's a heap of shorthands that I touched on briefly that, you c that makes life a little bit easier in a lot of ways. Right? But I honestly don't, I think the concepts are really important. Understanding how this stuff works, understanding its implications for things like performance. But I, I, animation is not something I think that you, you work out at the code level, right? I think it's something you should definitely think about exploring much more visually. Um, and at the moment, the tools are kind of, there's some interesting tools, but no one's really got there yet. And that's something we, I did a workshop on yesterday with Pascal, who was speaking uh, after lunch, that I really think if you're interested in this stuff, he's going to talk about animation principles and how they apply to user interfaces. And it was fantastic to do the workshop with him yesterday around that. Right. So what's next for you to do? Well, as I mentioned, Pascal's doing uh, that presentation. I really recommend you have a look at that if that's what interests you. Um, our good friends at Adobe have uh, an animation tool, uh, a lot like Flash in terms of user experience, but it produces web-based content. And they, you know, we've got a little competition running with them to get people to go out there and explore animated text. Right? It doesn't have to be long. And they're giving away some kind of creative cloud things. And they've got a heap of swag there as well. So I really think you should maybe go talk to them about that. There's a link online, and we'll send it around. And there's a couple of weeks for you to go play with this. So what better excuse than go play with it? And you know, my, my general experience with these things is if you go and do that, you've got a pretty good chance of winning something, right? Uh, and I guess, I, I really, I guess the, the ultimate thing is I feel like animation is the new typography, right? <laughs> and, Typography on the web took a very long time to get there. And you know, especially when things like Typekit and at font face stuff really started to take off, the first thing people said is, oh my god, people are going to do such horrible things with fonts. And you know what? They did. And you know what? That was good, right? Because <laughs> we're learning. So, so I guess my point around this is, you know, like, has anyone seen this episode of The Simpsons where Mel, uh, uh, Flanner's wife dies? Yeah? And, now, and then he wants to go dating, so Homer makes the video. And then every transition is a star wipe, right? I don't just do star wipes for everything, right? I guess that's my. I should finish with that little little video bit there. But yeah, it is the new typography. There's so much power there, but don't do it just as a gimmick. Don't just do it as like, oh, I, I can and I will because I can. Think about how we can create meaningful transitions, how we can kind of use the third dimension of space and the fourth dimension of time. So we've we've spent our life working in two dimensions, left, right, up, down. Now we have two whole new dimensions to explore, right? So we should go and explore those. And, and a great way to do that is look at animation, because those guys have been exploring how you render 3D in 2D for many, many years. So thanks very much for that. I don't know if I've got time for questions, but it's been fantastic telling you about that. Thank you.